too much. Right? You're fine. Okay. You get a family picture? Come on, you guys. Get a family picture. There you go. <laughs> All the great scientists, and this is one of them. Kepler and Galileo, Newton. Yeah. We got one right here. It's fantastic. Amazing. My name is Stephen Hawking. For the past 50 years, I have traveled the world studying and lecturing about time and space and the laws that govern the universe. This film is a personal journey through my life, told in my own words. Come with me, and I will show you how I live and work today, and tell you the story of how I became who I am. Welcome to my world. So you're going to take for lunch in the cafeteria. It's up to you. Yes. I think it would kill him if he was in a home being cared for by nurses. I think that would be the end for him. He likes to be able to choose what he wants to do with his life. He loves the danger of flying. He wants to go into space and he's been in submarines. <laughs> he's just the most craziest man. <laughs> He's got a lot of guts in him. Just through here is um, the nurse's room. So if anything medical happens, we'll just grab a phone, phone 999. But there is not much we can actually do because Stephen is on a nippy, which he'll breathe on. If that fails, the only other thing we could do, and we do have, um, we have oxygen cylinders, and we can give him oxygen, but if he's in total state, then we will have to let him go. I have lived over two thirds of my life with the threat of death hanging over me. because every new day could be my last. I have developed a desire to make the most of each and every minute. Although I'm 71 now, I still go to work every day at Cambridge University. I'll see you in a bit. Enjoy shopping. Keeping an active mind has been vital to my survival as has been maintaining a sense of humor. When um, I went to my job interview, I thought he was going to ask me about my past medical history and what I've done before in care, but he didn't. He asked whether I could cook poached eggs. <laughs> and 
I was 19 at the time and I lied because <laughs> I didn't know how to cook poached eggs but I got the job straight away. <laughs> uh, we're not going to work anymore, it's like just going to go and see a friend. Well, family. Stephen's been there through the years of me growing up and like turning into an adult. So he's been there through most of the important stages of my life. I've had a very privileged life, thanks to Stephen. <laughs> Do you enjoy my company? Maybe. <laughs> You're horrible to me, aren't you? Yes. <laughs> As you can see, the gradual advance of my illness has meant that I am totally reliant on those around me. 71 years ago, life started that way too. I was born in 1942 exactly 300 years after the death of Galileo. My parents were both at Oxford University, where my father studied medicine. He later specialized in tropical diseases. It is often said that a person's early years are a good indication of how they will turn out. Perhaps my eldest sister Mary remembers me best. I remember Stephen was very bright, always into things. I remember my father made me a doll's house, so Stephen put in both plumbing and lighting. <laughs> he liked to win. He liked to win in everything. We all learnt to play drafts. I beat Stephen once, once at drafts, and he immediately took up chess, and I never beat him at that again. <laughs> I also spend a lot of time playing on my own as a boy. I had a passion to understand how things worked, from toy trains to the whole universe. He would spend a lot of time looking at the sky, looking at the um, stars, and wondering where eternity came to an end. He couldn't conceive that there could be something without a finish. Home life was always stimulating for me and my siblings. My mother and father were intellectuals, and naturally they expected their children to follow. Both my parents were moving in the Highgate, Hampstead, intelligentsia, that sort of circle. We always talked. Everyone talked and everybody argued. We used to argue theology a lot. It's a great thing for kids because you don't need any facts whatsoever. To outsiders, the Hawking household was considered eccentric. But for me, it was a place where my mind was constantly challenged. There were books everywhere. Bookshelves that were double banked. Bookshelves that had, on top of the upright books, rows of other books shoehorned in wherever there was space. It was a less conventional house, one in which the children had a great deal of freedom. And I remember being quite gobsmacked by the conversation over lunch. Um, it was about subjects which were never talked about in my house. Sex, homosexuality, arguments for and against abortion, and various other subjects that were quite unusual. As I developed into a teenager, my parents taught me to always question things and think big. Stephen devised, and remember this was in the early 1950s, not just one, but two computers, which we built from scratch. It was about the size of a half-depth fridge, but about as tall and about as wide. It solved logical problems posed in binary. If this condition is true and that condition is true, or that condition instead is true, 
then, and it would give you the, what the then meant. At school, my classmates gave me the nickname Einstein, even though I was only ever halfway up the class. It was, I like to think, a very bright class. It was always assumed Stephen would go to Oxford. Both my parents had been to Oxford. You know, he was extremely bright. There was never any doubt about this. He and my father had a difference of opinion about what he should study. Father thought it would be a good thing if Stephen did medicine. But Stephen was not into medicine. He'd have made the most awful doctor, I was thinking. <laughs> so they compromised. We agreed on a degree in natural sciences, specializing in physics. The prevailing attitude at Oxford at the time was very handy work. You were supposed to be brilliant without effort. Or to accept your limitations and get a fourth class degree. To work hard to get a better class of degree was regarded as the mark of a gray man, the worst epithet in the Oxford vocabulary. I think Steve and I fell, both of us, right into that category that there was no need to work or appear to work. And uh, Steve was a very funny guy. He was able to appreciate jokes and tell jokes the whole time. And uh, spontaneous humor uh, uh, was uh, really his forte. <laughs> Oxford I joined the rowing club and became a cox. I relished in the freedom, the speed, and of course, calling the shots. The rowing club also introduced me to one of my favorite pastimes at Oxford. Partying. I once calculated that I did about a thousand hours work in the three years I was there, an average of an hour a day. I'm not proud of this lack of work. I'm just describing my attitude at the time, which I shared with most of my fellow students. Within the whole year, people gradually thought of Steve as being the brilliant guy in the year. But he was brilliant in the sense that he could make off-the-cuff remarks, which were deep. So he was definitely a standout person of intellect. The question always was whether he would use that intellect to go anywhere. Well, if the number of champagne receptions one goes to is a measure of success, then it would seem that I had made it. Tonight, I am guest of honor at the launch of a supercomputer called Cosmos in Cambridge. Cosmos is one of the most powerful computers in the world and will enable us to better understand our place in the universe. Stevens, perhaps the world's most famous scientist, and uh, you know, one can't deny that it's it's fantastic to have his support. It really is a big day for theoretical cosmology in the UK. of fame is a curious thing to me. In my mind, I am a scientist, 
who has been lucky to work on some of the fundamental mysteries of our universe. Sometimes I wonder if I am as famous for my wheelchair and disabilities as I am for my discoveries. As my student days were in full swing, I was gradually becoming aware that all was not well. During my final year at Oxford, I had noticed that I was getting rather clumsy in my movements. And I fell over once or twice for no apparent reason. But then one evening, late at night, something more serious happened. I recall the time that Steve fell down the stairs. He fell downstairs all the way to the bottom. He lost consciousness, and then he couldn't remember who he was. He couldn't remember where he was, so it was a very serious thing. When I looked back at that fall, I didn't realize at the time it was a warning sign of things to come. But, I recovered, and soon had more pressing things on my mind. Despite my relaxed attitude to study, I graduated with first-class honors, and left Oxford for Cambridge University to begin my PhD. Yet, little did I know, I would soon be diagnosed with a crippling illness that would change my life forever. Well, Stephen's speed of communication has very gradually slowed down. A few years ago, he was still able to use his hand switch and able to communicate by clicking this switch on his wheelchair. Um, when he wasn't able to do that anymore, we switched over to a switch that he mounted on his cheek. But with him slowing down with that, we've approached his sponsors, and so they've been looking into facial recognition. This is a, a high-speed camera which will allow us to see very fine details on the facial expressions, and this will help us to improve the rate of your speech and input. Yeah. I have had to learn to live with my slow rate of communication. I can only write by flinching my cheap muscle to move the cursor on my computer. One day I fear this muscle will fail, but I would like to be able to speak more quickly. Do you want me to change it to English alphabetic? Yeah, I'm buzzing. Yeah. No. Is that all? Is that all okay, Stephen? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not getting this at all, Stephen. Sometimes he can make a mistake and then he deletes it, and then he makes another mistake and deletes it. And, uh, you know, it can be frustrating there watching, and he can see the frustration on his face as well. I am hoping this current generation of software experts can harness what little movement I have left in my face and turn it into faster communication. Your current piece of software is a little dated. Well, it's a lot dated, but you're very used to using it. So we changed the method by which your next word prediction works, and it can pretty much pick up the correct word every single time, even if you're, even if you're letters away from it. This is a big improvement over the previous version. I really like it. That's pretty amazing there. I think it's actually gone brilliantly. 
the stuff that we showed him he was excited about anything better than what he's doing I think is going to be a success and anything that doesn't complicate Steven's life any more than it is I think that will be a success as well In 1962, 8.20, when I arrived at Cambridge to begin my PhD, I was also desperate for my voice to be heard as I embarked on my first real scientific challenge. At the time, two theories battled to correctly describe the universe. The steady state theory held that the universe had always existed and would exist forever. But, there was another, more exciting idea. The Big Bang Theory suggested that the universe had begun with a huge explosion. I decided to try to see if I could shed any light on how the Big Bang came to be. But, by now, the immediate challenge I was facing was to keep control of my body. My movements were becoming even more erratic. Though I was determined not to worry my family, so I tried to keep it to myself. Stephen went home for Christmas after one term, and the symptoms that he had had become too severe to hide from his parents. His father insisted on taking him to, I think, the family doctor first, and then that doctor recommended a specialist in London. So after Christmas, Stephen and his father went to London and St. Bartholomew's Hospital. I was in hospital for two weeks and had a wide range of unpleasant tests. They took a muscle sample from my arm and stuck electrodes into me. Then they injected some liquid into my spine and took x-rays. Eventually, I was diagnosed with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, otherwise known as motor neuron disease or ALS. The prognosis was not good. I was given two to three years to live. It was always hard to tell how Stephen took it, because one thing, he wouldn't talk about it. You know, if you can't do anything about it, you probably don't want to talk about it or, or have people talk about it. He did seem pretty depressed, and I don't think he accepted it emotionally. The whole family went to pieces. It was such a shock for everybody. My aunt turned white in the night, and we all thought it, he'd be you know, he was not going to be able to live for very long. Not knowing what was going to happen to me, or how rapidly the disease would progress, I was at a loose end. The doctors told me to go back to Cambridge and carry on with my research. But I was not making much progress, and anyway, I might not live long enough to finish my PhD. I felt somewhat of a tragic character. I took to listening to Wagner.
Partner, the annunciation of death made a great impression on me when I first heard it, as I had just developed motor neuron disease. I identified with it, and still do today. But as it turned out, I didn't die. At first the disease seemed to progress fairly rapidly. As time went by however, it seemed to slow down. I also began to make progress with my work. But what really made the difference, was falling in love with a girl called Jane Wilde, whom I had met about the same time I was diagnosed. This gave me something to live for. Oh, he was great fun. He was eccentric. I was really drawn to his very wide smile and his beautiful grey eyes. And I think that's what made me fall in love with him. We were going to defy the disease, we were going to defy the doctors, and we were going to challenge the future. Jane was beautiful, and gentle, and seemingly undaunted by the harsh reality of my illness. Falling in love, and getting engaged, was the motivation that I needed. If I were to get married, I had to get a job, and to get a job I had to finish my PhD. I therefore started working hard for the first time in my life. To my surprise, I found I liked it. Well, Stephen found his groove. He found his trajectory, and when Stephen finds a trajectory, he pursues it. It was terribly exciting, because he had been so depressed, and here he was with a new lease of life, Perhaps because I realized I might not have much time, I renewed my efforts to tackle the big question in cosmology in the early 60s. Did the universe have a beginning, or not? Many scientists were instinctively opposed to the idea of a Big Bang, because it implies a moment of creation. The hand of God. For me though, Religion has no role to play in physics, so I wondered if the Big Bang could have happened on its own, without the need for a god to get it going. The key was in the theory of black holes. At the time, physicist Roger Penrose was working on what happens when a star collapses under the force of its own gravity. Penrose claimed the star would crush itself to a tiny point of infinite density, where even time itself would come to a stop. He called it a singularity, the heart of a black hole. When I was doing this work on the gravitational collapse of black holes, I'd never heard of Stephen. So I had a little private session, and he was somebody who picked up ideas quickly. He sort of stood out as being somebody who asked extremely awkward questions. I do remember that. I worked relentlessly to see if I could apply the notion of a singularity to the entire universe. Then suddenly, I had it. I imagined going backwards to the beginning and worked out that right at the start, the universe would have been a singularity too. Here, time stops, you've reached the true beginning of everything. There is no previous time in which the universe could have had a cause. It spontaneously created itself in the Big Bang. The work that Stephen did basically showed there was 
singular state which couldn't have come from a previous universe. So you could say it is a theory which tells you that the universe had a beginning. By addressing the question of creation that physicists had avoided, I had controversially shown the laws of nature suggest there is no need for a creator or God. The universe just came into existence all by itself. My findings about the Big Bang and the possible beginning of the universe gave me the results I needed to enhance my PhD. I applied for a research fellowship at Gonville and Keyes College which proved successful. The money from the fellowship meant that Jane and I could get married, which we did in July 1965. We had the maximum number of guests in the tiny chapel. Stephen was walking with a stick and he was losing strength in his arms. And we went off for our honeymoon to upstate New York to a physics conference at Cornell University. And there I got to know that a goddess in Stephen's life with whom I was sharing the marriage was physics. After returning from our honeymoon, Jane and I bought a house in Little St. Mary's Lane, in the center of Cambridge. In March 1966, I completed and submitted my PhD thesis, with the help of Jane who had spent many painstaking hours at the typewriter, typing it up. The findings in my thesis greatly enhanced my reputation in cosmology. Stephen's profile certainly did <laughs> rocket. <laughs> it's important to know that there was a Big Bang because that governs our cosmology. It's also important to know what it was like and why it was like what it was like because when you trace back everything in nature, you get ultimately to the Big Bang. And the fact that it was a singular state is very much part of that understanding. Stephen, I'll just do a quick recap um, of, of my PhD, yeah, that's fine. My early work went some way to answering how our universe began. But there is still plenty more to find out. Brain world black holes that radiate if they aren't extreme, but slowly. At Cambridge, I mentor a new generation of cosmologists who are tackling ever tougher questions. It's this work that I enjoy the most. Might as well say the Schwarzschild solution doesn't exist because it radiates. Well, I'll have to think about it. He's in office every day, and I mean, it's it's basically for us PhD students, it's great. I mean, he's there for us if we want him to, kind of, right? So it's no, no. I mean, it's a, it's it's it's, it's a great privilege. I have always wanted to share my enthusiasm and excitement. There's nothing like the eureka moment of discovering something that no one knew before. I won't compare it to sex, but it lasts longer. My next major eureka moment happened when I was least expecting it. In the autumn of 1970, I had been concentrating my research on black holes. By now Jane and I had two children. Robert aged three years and Lucy who had just been born. One evening in November, as I was getting ready for bed, an idea charged through my brain. 
only cosmologists would truly grasp it. But it would greatly enhance my reputation. I was sitting on one side of the bed, and Stephen was sitting on the other side of the bed, tussling with his buttons. And this was one evening when he took longer about it than usual. So I finished feeding the baby. And then he said, I think I've solved a problem. Suddenly, I had a revelation about what happens when two black holes collide and merge. I realized that the surface area of the new black hole could only get bigger, it could never decrease in size. This may sound like an obscure discovery, but it revealed some fundamental properties of the universe. Even though few physicists could understand it at the time, for me, it was very exciting. I was writing the rule book for black holes. Now my voice would really be heard. I knew he'd done something very important, so I was absolutely thrilled. And this, of course, made his name in a big way in physics. He'd been recognized as somebody with great potential, but now he really had a discovery to his name. By the early 1970s, my career in cosmology and my understandings of the universe were beginning to blossom. But as my mind grew in confidence, my body was going into a rapid decline. At home I was reluctant to ask for help from outsiders and was relying upon Jane more and more to help me get up in the morning, get dressed, and get to work. And when I got to Cambridge, I needed my <laughs> students to help me too. Are we fine in this? <laughs> yes. I first met Stephen in 1972 at Cambridge when I became his PhD student. He was in a, in a wheelchair, but a push wheelchair. And so I also had a role in, in, in helping him with eating and moving around and having coffee and tea and things like that. So it was a rather unusual relationship. In those days, Stephen, of course, was still speaking with his voice, but his voice was still weak, so it wasn't so easy to hear what he was saying. And indeed, when I travelled with Stephen, I would often be acting as an interpreter. So Stephen would say something, and if the person he's speaking to couldn't understand, I would then repeat it. Although I was becoming increasingly trapped inside my dysfunctioning body, fortunately my mind was unaffected. I had a new big question I felt compelled to find the answer to. My reputation in the field of black holes was established as we entered a golden age. But my next discovery would throw all of cosmologists' findings to date up in the air. The calculations I was working on involved what happened to particles on the edge of a black hole that were sucked in and disappeared. To my great surprise, I found that some particles could escape the black hole, which seemed to make a mockery of the known laws of physics. At first I thought this must be a mistake. I do remember when he was working on this problem, and indeed I even remember when he told me he was working out the quantum effects of these black holes, and he seemed to be getting this flux of particles coming out. When Stephen's thinking about a problem, he will become obviously obsessed with it. It was a very intense period. It was when 
he could be surrounded by children and not notice what was going on because he was like Rodin's thinker with his head in his hands, often accompanied by Wagner blaring out from the loudspeakers. He used to drive me spare. Finally, after months of exhaustive work, I found what I was looking for. Contrary to all previously held theories and black holes, I discovered that they must emit particles like a hot body losing heat. This evaporation meant in theory, a black hole could eventually disappear. I announced my findings on St. Valentine's Day in 1974 at a cosmology conference in Oxford to a packed audience. He came to an end and there was absolute silence in the lecture hall. And I can see it now. The chairman of the lecture jumped to his feet and instead of saying, oh, I must thank Professor Hawking for his remarkable lecture, he said, this is preposterous. I've never heard anything like it. The whole place was a buzz. People couldn't believe what they had heard. My controversial discovery initially shocked the world of physics. But eventually it became accepted and known as Hawking Radiation. I am proud to have discovered it. This was a remarkably important result because it was a result which unified relativity theory and, and quantum theory and, and thermodynamics. And physics is really all about unifying ideas. These three subjects seem to be brought together and this was the first time we'd seen that kind of unification. Every now and then in physics, you get a result which is, it's so beautiful, it really is like rolling candy on the tongue. Oh, I was enormously proud, enormously proud of what Stephen had achieved. After I announced my theory of Hawking radiation and a later discovery of exploding black holes, a procession of international awards followed. In the spring of 1974, I was inducted into the Royal Society, one of the most prestigious bodies of scientists. My name now sat alongside Isaac Newton and Charles Darwin. A year later, I received the gold medal for science from Pope Paul VI. Age 32, I was thrilled to have such high-profile awards to my name an exciting new opportunities background. In 1974, doors started to open for me. And I was invited on a visiting professorship to the Californian Institute of Technology in Los Angeles. This meant moving with the whole family for the academic year, and the lure of the American West Coast was irresistible. We were in the midst of a revolution in the application of quantum physics to black holes. I was simply hoping to have a year in which the result would be better science done by Caltech scientists, by my research group and others, and better science done by Stephen. Life in California was very different from Cambridge. I now had a large salary in a big house, just a stone's throw from the university. Well, America could have been on another planet. 
We were living in the lap of luxury. No expense spared to make us welcome. And this great gift of an electric wheelchair provided for Stephen's use. Yet, although we had all the mod cons that America could offer us, it was becoming clear that the demands of home life unchained were becoming too intense. Looking after two young children and trying to cope with my ever-increasing disabilities were causing too much strain. I could not see my way through what it was going to demand of me. And this wonderful idea came to me. If we were going to go to California and the students were going to come too, why didn't we offer them um, a bed in our house in return for some help with Stephen? Of course, it's not the normal relationship between a student and the PhD supervisor. But for me, that was a good deal because I live rent free in exchange for sort of helping Stephen out around the home, you know, at bath times and helping him with meals and things like that. But the excitement of a new life in California was harshly interrupted by my motor neuron disease. The physical symptoms took an irreversible turn for the worst. That was the year in which he lost the use of his hands. When he arrived, he could still write equations, though with some difficulty. By the end of the year, he couldn't. So it was, uh, in terms of his physical development, it was a more difficult period. On the other hand, in terms of his mental development, as he gradually lost the use of his hands, he further developed his unique ways of thinking by manipulating shapes and topologies in his head and became even more advanced than the rest of us. By losing the finer dexterity of my hands, I was forced to travel through the universe in my mind and try to visualize the ways in which it worked. He could move at lightning speed across the frontiers of knowledge and see things that nobody else could see. The disability forced him to carry himself in new ways, new directions. Turning problems over in my mind has been my main method of discovery for nearly half my life now. While all around me people have buzzed away, deep in conversation, I have often been transported afar, lost inside my own thoughts, trying to fathom how the universe works. When we returned from California in the summer of 1975, much of the future, living with my illness, seemed uncertain. So, Jane and I took comfort in the security of a happy family life. And to make home life easier, we realized my disabilities meant that we needed a student living with us full time. I knew that Stephen Hawking was a brilliant scientist, and I was told that he was severely disabled. I was told that his voice was very weak, so it would probably take about a week before, you know, I could understand what he was saying. Of course, because of Stephen's circumstances, you could say no day was really normal. <laughs> Stephen had these massive batteries that were in his wheelchair, and of course he had spares, and so I, I loaded as many as I could on the bottom of Stephen's wheelchair. 
And Stephen didn't know it. I'd loaded it down sampling, and I didn't want to have to carry the thing. So he starts up the hill, and then I see him turning the corner, and he's about <laughs> 10, about 20 meters away, and I see him slowly tipping backwards. And he fell over into the bushes. Yeah, this was somewhat alarming to see the master of gravity being overcome by the Earth's gravitational field and falling into the, into the bushes. So I went up to retrieve him, and he was, of course, quite upset. It was perhaps good that I couldn't understand all that he said at that occasion. Yeah. I could have caught that if I realized it was going to stop. Although my increasing disabilities were greatly affecting my life more and more, I was fiercely reluctant to accept nursing care. I was convinced that I could build a team of people around me who could care for me in their own way. We didn't have any nurses at all in the department. That was part of my role. I would look after him. You would like to reply to that one? Well, I had to wipe his nose, comb his hair for him if it was falling down into his eyes. And I could see that when he was eating or, or drinking, this could um, cause a, a problem and a very big one for me because I didn't have any nursing uh, training whatsoever. <coughs> he would have these coughing fits that would be quite severe and it, you know, you sort of think he's gonna choke and die at any moment. <coughs> I felt responsible to try to give him the best care I could, but it was scary thinking what might happen to him. <coughs> One night, Stephen had the most horrendous choking fit, and I just didn't know what to do. And everything just shook. Windows rattled, doors shook. It was the most terrifying experience, and it could have been critical. Although I was able to live and work as I wanted, I was never really able to understand the strain it was placing on the people around me. Especially my wife, Jane. I was beginning to feel that there were two faces to our situation. One was the public image, the wunderkind of physics, um, who had overcome motor neurone disease, who was whizzing round the world in his wheelchair to receive honours and medals, and the other side, the other face, was the home situation, where sometimes the illness forced us into our own little black hole. The decline in my health was a stark reminder that time was against me. Yet despite the pressures on my family, I was determined to realize a lifelong ambition by writing a popular book about how the universe had begun. I wanted the book to be read by millions of people around the world like a best-selling airport novel. I did not think it would work. I did not think it would work because Basically, uh, if you look at all the other books in airports, there are none like that. <laughs> However, I felt sure that the mass market would want to know about how the universe began. By 1984, I had completed the first chapter. There was great interest in him. He was a great public figure, so actually every publisher in town was interested in the book. I guess we had a contract ready for him to sign and I had heard that he was going to be in Chicago. So I was there and waiting, and then this car pulls into the parking lot, and this gentleman gets out, and he goes back to the passenger door and scoops what looks like a kind of life-size broken doll uh, into his arms and brings it back to the wheelchair and kind of gently eases the doll into place, and suddenly the doll becomes animated. As soon as that hand is on the controls, the thing literally, it kicks into life, spins around two, three times, and takes off. And then Brian shouts to me, I've gotten out of my car, he shouts, is that you, is that Peter Gazzotti? And I said, yes, it's, it's me. And he says, well, quick, follow us, that's Professor Hawking. 
I signed up with Peter and set to work completing the first draft of my book. I tried to simplify the physics as best I could, and by the end I was pleased and felt it was in pretty good shape. But Peter wasn't convinced. I was pretty disappointed. Yeah, I thought this is going to be really difficult. But I just decided we'd made a substantial commitment to it, and by God, we were going to do this book. So let's just start slogging. And then maybe lightning would strike or something wonderful would happen. Lightning did indeed strike, but not in the way that Peter and I were hoping. That summer I had taken a break from rewriting to travel to Switzerland on holiday. But while I was there, I caught a chest infection that developed into pneumonia and quickly became very serious. I was put into a drug-induced coma and onto a life support machine. The doctor thought I was so far gone they offered to Jane to turn off the machine. But she refused. Finally, Jane insisted that I was flown back to Cambridge. I remember very vividly walking through the doors and being really quite rocked by what I saw when I got in there. And I realized that Stephen was really very, very ill. Things were not looking good. He could have died. We were just told that he couldn't breathe. And of course, we knew how weak he was at that time. And he had been ill before. And we all knew that he was on borrowed time. The weeks of intensive care were the darkest of my life. I felt I had always fought my illness so hard that I was not prepared to give in so easily. Slowly the drugs began to work and the infection passed. But the surgeons had to perform a tracheotomy to allow me to breathe, which made a small incision in my windpipe and connected me to a ventilator via the hole in my throat. As a result, I was now robbed of the ability to talk. I faced a life unable to properly communicate. It was a very worrying time for everyone around him, and you're thinking, do you think you'll ever be able to talk again, or how will you work if you can't talk? So yes, it was a very bleak time. All hopes of finishing my book, and perhaps even my career, seemed to be over. It was very tense for everybody. It was incredibly tense. It was difficult to think that Stephen was going to come out of there and be OK. As the weeks of my recovery turned into months, it became obvious to me, and everyone around me, that being on a ventilator meant that I needed constant care and monitoring to keep alive. This was a very big realization that things were going to dramatically change, and that this was going to be needing 24-hour uh, day nursing care. Their lives would never, ever going to be the same again. Once nurses came into the house, life changed. And that was very difficult for all of us, for me, for the children. Home was no longer home. There was no privacy, no privacy, because the walls were listening to everything. Despite the intrusions on family life, with the nurse's help, I grew stronger. Yet, 
I still felt trapped inside my body. For a time, at home, I could communicate only by raising my eyebrows when someone pointed a letter on a card. All thoughts of work and finishing my book grew distant. <laughs> But then quite unexpectedly, a glimmer of hope came from across the water. I got a call from a physicist, and he said, uh, I know you're working on computer systems for people with ALS. He says, I've got uh, someone in England, he's a professor of physics, who lost the ability to speak, and he needs a system. This system was called Equalizer and the top part of the screen was a, a set of letters, rows of letters. And then the bottom part of the screen was rows of words, 36 very frequently used words. So he could choose the top part or the bottom part. He learned that very quickly and I was blown away by it. He was, he was uh, scanning just amazingly fast. I had enough movement in my right hand to be able to click the computer system and write the words I wanted. Finally, I was free to communicate again. I was keen to make up the lost time that my illness had forced upon me. I had a stack of notes from Peter Gazzardi suggesting changes and clarifications to my book. But I needed practical help with the rewrite at my end someone who could act as a go-between. The people in the States were speaking on a loudspeakerphone in his office and Stephen was writing using his new computer system on the screen and then you would say what he was saying over the phone. We're just sort of cobbling it together, I think is probably the right term. I had no idea what was going on on Stephen's side of this, where I, it seems that he was persuading Stephen that this was okay, uh, helping Stephen off the walls if Stephen started to think, why the hell am I spending all this time uh, making this idiot understand this, this basic stuff? After months of work, the rewrite was complete. None of us really knew whether the book would be liked and would sell as we all hoped for. All we could do now was give it a title, a brief history of time, send it off to the printers, and wait. But to everyone's surprise, the book sold copy after copy. And very quickly bookshops were selling out. When it hit the bestseller list, you're obviously surprised. It was a pleasant surprise, and it certainly was a surprise. I don't think you'll find anybody, maybe I'm wrong, who'll say, oh yes, we knew all along this was going to be a, a major hit. I had no expectation that it would be the number one best-selling book in the world. I mean, not just here, but Germany, Slovenia, France, Italy, everywhere in the world, there was the hope that someone had found the mystery of life. And from then on, it was just a race to keep the book in print, and and uh, kind of marching towards a million copies sold. <laughs> you know, it was very gratifying. Uh, you know, in the 38 years that I've been in this business, um, I don't think I've ever had a book that stayed at the top of the bestseller list that long. Well, I was amazed at to how well it did. I think it worked. He inspired people. He gave people some overall sense of the birth of the universe and it made this subject become a subject of conversation among people in all walks of life. Professor Stephen Hawking's book, A Brief History of Time, an unlikely but successful publishing phenomenon. A Brief History of Time has sold about 8 million copies. A popular book about his theories is already topping the American bestsellers list. The hugely successful A Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking. A Brief History of Time stayed in the bestseller list for over four years and entered into the Guinness Book of Records for doing so. To date, over 10 million copies have been sold worldwide.
for the next few years a lot of fuss was made about my book. I became famous nationally and around the world, as it was translated into 40 different languages. Delighted to welcome Professor Stephen Hawking. I was invited on the chat shows. Well, I think people do think of you as a genius, not just as a disabled genius. And I even made a cameo appearance on Star Trek, my favorite sci-fi show. You are bluffing. Wrong again, Albert. I enjoy the media attention. And witnessing everyday people getting more involved in understanding the physics of our universe. But soon the press wanted to know more about me, my illness, and my family life. He wanted this worldwide celebrity. He enjoys that, and part of his whole outlook on life and his science is that it's fun, and celebrity was fun. And he embraced it in a way that was not necessarily very good for the family, the children. So this was a further real problem in the marriage. We were engulfed and swept away by this great wave of fame and fortune. And I have to say that really, it all got rather too much for me to cope with. And I suppose that's when we ceased to be as happy as we had been. And then when the marriage broke up, I felt as if a rug, not just had been pulled up from under my feet, but the earth had opened up under that rug and swallowed me up because the marriage had been my raison d'etre. And it took me quite a little while to recover my sense of my own identity. It was clear that my life and chains were beginning to follow different paths. In 1990 we separated and were divorced in 1995. In the same year, I announced my engagement to Elaine Mason, and married again. Elaine had been one of my nurses, from the start of my 24-hour wraparound care. Over the years, we had become extremely close, as Jane and I drifted apart, each seeking comfort and love through new relationships. Elaine became closer to Stephen than any of the other nurses. When he traveled, he would prefer to have her with him over the others. It became a, a close relationship. My marriage to Elaine was passionate and tempestuous. She saved my life on several occasions and we were together for 11 years before divorcing in 2006. The low point was when the press printed unsubstantiated allegations that I had been the victim of domestic violence. To my mind, this was a gross invasion of our privacy and was an extremely hurtful and damaging time for us both. Unfortunately, being in the public eye can have its drawbacks. Living a very public life does, however, have its upsides too. At work, I am often visited by famous people who share an interest in space and the universe we live in. Sometimes, even astronauts drop by. 
my voice is listened to because I did something 43 years ago. And I have the sense of humans reaching outward and succeeding, but I believe that he is valued more because he has the, uh, the pure analytical combined with the philosophical that comes from his understanding of the beginnings and the ends of the universe. I have often dreamt about traveling through space myself. Recently, I got closer by experiencing a zero-gravity flight. It was also a moment that temporarily stripped me of my disability. A feeling of true freedom. pioneering efforts of the early astronauts like Buzz need to be taken onto the next level. I am convinced that one day, humans will have to colonize other planets in order to survive. Space travel will become an everyday necessity. Until then, I hope to be one of the first ordinary people to blast off into space. But I will need a little help. I just couldn't think of anybody in the world that we'd rather send to space than Stephen Hawking. And, you know, we haven't offered anybody a free ticket, but it was the one person in the world that we, that we felt, you know, we'd love to invite into space. And it was incredible when he accepted. And I went up and saw him that day, and he told me to hurry up and get the spaceship built because he wasn't going to live forever. And hopefully next year we'll take him up. And I think that, you know, he feels that if he goes into space personally, he can, he can lead the way. My hopes for space travel have been with me throughout my life. But as my wheels are still firmly planted here on planet Earth, I will keep on dreaming. As I am now considered a so-called famous person, more and more of my time is taken up with my public life. For this, I rely greatly upon my team around me. You are really the gatekeeper in this role. You get the general fan mail, hero-worshipping him, really. Then you get people who are obsessed with religion and God and the fact that Professor Hawking doesn't appear to have a God as such that they can um, feel comfortable about. So you get a huge range of what we call the God letters. And then you get letters from the disabled, serious scientists, mostly people full of admiration for Professor Hawking and what he has achieved. He is a great iconic figure and he enjoys his public appearances and it's great that, you know, he's still very engaged with everything that surrounds him. So, if you want to explore the inside of a black hole, choose a big one. People have searched for many black holes of this mass, but have so far not found any. This is a pity, because if they had, I would have got a Nobel Prize.
If you had asked me 40 years ago, if I ever thought I would be talking in front of a sellout crowd, and be a part of popular culture, I would have laughed. But, if my getting involved with the zeitgeist that is upon us, has encouraged people to question our universe, then I am okay. Stephen Hawking! The world's smartest man! What are you doing here? If you are looking for trouble, you found it. Yeah, just try me, you... Oh! He's willing to teach people in whatever way he has to teach people. You can't take yourself too seriously, no matter how intelligent or how important the work you're doing is. Uh, this is Jim's phone. It's such an honor to give it for you. Hello! Whenever I do a talk show, I'm trying to think of ways to do things that are completely different and completely ridiculous. Most people see Dumb and Dumber and they assume that that's who I am. So I thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful to, like, partner up with the smartest man on the earth? So, oh, excuse me. <laughs> Hello. Hello, Tim. This is... Oh, hi, Stephen Hawking. I can't believe wow. it. He was wonderful. He he was just fantastic. I was I was expecting to be so him to be so serious about himself, and uh, I think it was a relief for him to uh, to completely make fun of the whole thing. I just wanted to call just to tell you how happy I am that you're excited about the new electronic universe theory. Oh, thank you. Well, it's amazing. But don't bother trying to explain it to them. <laughs> The P-Bridge cannot grasp the idea of the world on the bridge. Yeah, I know. He did a great job of doing the lines that I had written, and and, uh, and he was just gung-ho the whole time. Well, I had to go now. Okay. I'm very busy watching Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> I hope I can do the only subject. You truly are genius. No, you're a genius. No, you are. <laughs> no, you are. After we did the routine, we kind of struck up a friendship. So I was invited to his home. And one of the funny highlights of the night was that, uh, was that while, while we were having dinner, I asked him, you know, just for a picture, could you, could you run over my foot with your wheelchair? And that, <laughs> so I have a picture of me grimacing in agony and stuff. So it was wonderful, wonderful to be there, wonderful to talk to him and ask him important questions like, how many Higgs boson does it take to screw in a light bulb? And uh, I think he's still struggling with that. It has been a lot of fun, and also very strange, to see myself depicted in so many ways. But, perhaps the strangest, is to have had part of my early life portrayed by an actor. I felt a huge onus of responsibility to get that part of his life right. There was so much that happened to him. It's a terrifying prospect to have a completely functioning mind inside a body that locks you in, that keeps you stationary. One of the things I wanted to get right was to show the stages of the progression of his condition and where the instability and fear came from. The very obvious details, such as being at the top of a flight of stairs, that suddenly becomes the most enormous obstacle. Um, being on any sort of uneven ground, those feelings of vulnerability, he's incredibly stoic. I think that was probably the case when he was younger as well. I think he rolled up his sleeves and got on with it and look at the results. I mean, it's self-evident. The man became uh, a spokesperson for the most complex ideas. of being a public figure is being asked to do special things. Today I am center stage at the opening ceremony of the Paralympics Games. 
and it's an honor to do so. Ever since the dawn of civilization, people have craved for an understanding of the underlying order of the world. There ought to be something very special about the boundary conditions of the universe. And what can be more special than that there is no boundary? And there should be no boundary to human endeavor. The Paralympic Games are all about transforming our perception of the world. We are all different. There is no such thing as a standard or run-of-the-mill human being, but we share the same human spirit. However difficult life may seem, there is always something you can do and succeed at. The games provide an opportunity for athletes to excel, to stretch themselves and become outstanding in their field. So let us together celebrate excellence, friendship and respect. Good luck to you all. Having lived on this wonderful planet for over 71 years, I feel my proudest achievement has been to inspire people to think about the cosmos and our place in it. Since I believe there is no afterlife, I think it's important to realize we only have a very short time alive and should make the best of it. Today, I enjoy time together with family and friends. And despite my disabilities, I'll always keep wondering about the mysteries of the universe. Stephen's been ill since he was 20. You come to terms with the impending bereavement, and then suddenly find that it's not that impending after all. I'm sure there's plenty more he'd like to know about. Think how awful it would be to come to the end of questions. Stephen will carry on until they push him underground. <laughs> you, you, you don't just stop your mind. Stephen has always had this determination to survive, I guess. And every time Stephen gets critically ill, I always think, oh dear, I hope, you know, you're gonna get through this time. And he always does. He's just got this tremendous determination to, to live. And I, and I do think there is such a thing as the will to live. There are several components to his long survival. One is that he's, by a very large margin, the most stubborn person I've ever met. He is one of those very few people who can see far beyond the borders of current knowledge and see how things really work and set the directions for other people's research in attempts to prove him right or wrong. To recover from a broken marriage, it was very, very difficult. At first, we were in touch but then it got very, very difficult. But lately, we have been able to associate. I call on him perhaps once a fortnight. All those years with Stephen were a huge part of my life. They were my young years. They were my children. And 
I can't just wipe those from the record, and I wouldn't want to. It would be self-destructive to wipe those away. And I'm very, very proud of what Stephen has done. Life has thrown at me both good times and bad. Perhaps it is human nature that we adapt and survive. As for me, I have lived with the prospect of an early death most of my life. I'm not afraid of dying, but I'm in no hurry to die. I have so much I want to do and find out first. So for now, goodbye. And thank you for coming on a journey through my world.